Good morning, or should I say afternoon? I guess we've, cro we've crossed the, crossed the noontime, so I can say afternoon. I'm Arthur Herman, a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute and director and co-founder of Hudson's uh, Quantum Alliance Initiative, which is Hudson Institute's effort to bring policy, uh, particularly US policy, what's taking place here in this town, in line with the astounding technological developments that are underway in the field of quantum, quantum information science, quantum technology, and elsewhere. And this is, I'm happy to say, uh, the first of the conferences that we have are organizing and convening uh, as the Quantum Alliance Initiative uh, on issues relating to quantum. This is my opportunity to give you a preview of coming attractions, which include, in addition to today's event, uh, October 16th, <coughs> we'll be hosting a conference on Canada's Quantum Valley and the institutions there that are powering quantum technology research and applications uh, in Canada. Uh, I'm happy to tell you that Mike Lazaridis, co-founder of BlackBerry, will be our keynoting that event, uh, and also that this will be taking place during the DC Cyber Week. So if you're planning to attend that event, get in line, because I think it's going to be a standing room only for that event and for the interest that it's going to generate. And then in early November, Tom, what's the date for our quantum and AI conference? For November 14th, we'll be hosting an event on quantum and artificial intelligence and on the overlap between these two emerging technologies and what the policy uh, consequences, but also what the quality implications are for what's going to take place and how those technologies work together. Uh, and then we'll have future uh, conferences as well that I'll be able to let you know about as things unfold. Uh, the Quantum Alliance Initiative is very pleased to uh, uh, partner today with the Federalist Society in hosting our conference uh, and our discussion with four very distinguished and very knowledgeable panelists on the issue of quantum technology and intellectual property. How important is intellectual property? Well, let me tell you what one person, uh, someone no less than Abraham Lincoln, had to say about intellectual property in a speech that he gave before running for president. This is in 1859, in which he noted that the right of inventors and authors to royalties for their patents and copyrights, intellectual property, is the only mention of the word right in the entire body of the Constitution. That, that, and in the, it reads in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8, to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right in their respective writings and discoveries. And in fact, Lincoln recognized that this right was, in his view, one of the six great steps in the advance of civilization. The first, the advent of language. The second, the art of empirical discovery, uh, on which the arts as well as the sciences are based. The third major advance, according to Lincoln, was the invention of writing. And the fourth, the invention of the printing press. The fifth, Lincoln told his audience, was the, discover was the European discovery of America, which he said, because, quote, a new country is more, is more favorable, almost necessary, to the emancipation of thought and facilitating useful discoveries and inventions. Interesting that use of the term emancipation there by Lincoln in his speech talking about intellectual property and innovation. And then the sixth, the sixth major advance was the Constitution's recognition of patent and copyright uh, of intellectual property rights. In fact, he said, what this recognition does is, quote, secure to the inventor for a limited time the exclusive use of his invention and thereby adds the fuel of interest 
to the fire of genius in the discovery of new and useful things. Well, today, the fire of genius is settling into the field of quantum computing and quantum technology. Uh, the coming revolution that's taking place in quantum technology that will transform information technology in the 21st century. And is actually going to have an impact as great as the digital revolution was in the 20th century. And in fact, I think if Lincoln were alive today and looking at the transformations that are taking place, he would have to say that the quantum revolution represents the seventh major advance as important, perhaps, as the inventing of writing or the printing press. I'll leave it to others to decide whether it's as important as the discovery of America. Quantum revolution, the change that is taking place in the an exponential growth in the means by which quantum computers and quantum technology will be able to supersede the uh, kinds of breakthroughs and changes that we've gotten used to in the digital revolution in the 20th century. What the implications are extend far beyond simply information technology to transformations in terms of uh, economic relationships, social and cultural relationships, advances in science and medicine, as well as, and one of the key focuses for us here at the Quantum Alliance Initiative, as well as major changes in national security and in defense and foreign policy. But that's for, that's for another discussion. The focus here is intellectual property. How that quantum revolution and quantum computing both relate to and will be fostered by the way in which we think about intellectual property and the role of, the role of patent, copyright, those kinds of rights in the overall discussion. By the way, did you know Abraham Lincoln, uh, in fact, himself had a patent? 1849, did you know that? In fact, he had a patent for a device for to buoy vessels over shoals. He's the only president, as a matter of fact, to date, who has uh, a patent in his name. So with Lincoln's shadow hovering over the course of this conference, let me introduce the first of our distinguished panelists for the discussion that we're going to have today. And that's Charles Duan. Charles Duan is a senior fellow and director of technology and innovation policy at the R Street Institute where he focuses on intellectual property issues. Before joining R Street, Charles was director of the Patent Reform Project at Public Knowledge, where he handled all aspects of pub patent policy, ranging from outrage to the Hill to writing white papers and fi filing amicus briefs. Prior to this, he was a research associate to Professor Paul Ohm on a National Science Foundation project that investigated the policy implications of newly proposed internet architectures. Also worked as a patent attorney at Knob Martins. He's the author of a five-part plan for patent reform. He received his associate bachelor degree in computer science from Harvard and his Juris Doctor from Harvard Law School. It's my pleasure, distinct privilege, to introduce to you Charles Duan. Well, that, that was quite an introduction. Uh, thank you for that. And thank you to the Hudson Institute and the Federal Society for, um, for, for arranging this um, really fascinating panel on a fascinating topic. Um, I'm honestly mostly here just to learn about all of the amazing advances that seem to have happened in quantum computing over the last, um, the last number of years. Oh, I, I was telling I was telling some of, some of my co-panelists that the last time I heard of quantum computing was when I was in college, and the machines were entirely theoretical. So you know how how far have we come at this point? Um, as as was mentioned, I am a former patent lawyer, so I'm going to primarily give some background in terms of just what the patent system is, um, and particularly insofar as the problem that we're looking at is how is the patent system going to deal with a new technology, quantum, um, quantum computing. I thought that I would look at a couple of previous um, emerging technologies that have come up and seen how patents have affected the trajectory of the development of those technologies, and maybe we can draw some lessons for how quantum computing will interact with the patent system. 
Um, I'm assuming that most of you have at least some background in terms of what the patent system, what the patent system is like. Um, but I'll, I'll give sort of a very, very broad background. The basic idea behind a patent is that it provides an inventor with an exclusive right over the invention that they've come up with for a temporary um, period of time. This is an incredibly important right for a lot of inventors for at least two reasons. The first is, as Lincoln said, it provides a financial incentive to those who come up with new, in new inventions. It provides them with the space to create their inventions, to develop them, to market them without um, having to deal with free riders and competition. The second is that patents really facilitate uh, what's known as tech transfer, tech transfer, the ability of companies to work together in terms of developing a product. An inventor may not have all of the knowledge of manufacturing processes or marketing techniques, um, and you know, they'll need to be able to partner with other companies in order to do that. Patents allow for inventors to do that without fearing that they're disclosing their inventions to somebody else in ways that could potentially get in their way down the road. Now, patents, I think, serve this purpose very well in a lot of situations, but they've also been used in fairly problematic ways. And two of those that I've observed, at least in my, in my career, are first, a lot of times, large companies will obtain patents largely for the purpose of harassing small startups. I, I worked um, on, a, on a case when I was at my old law firm once where we were representing a small company who had formed a joint development agreement with a large company. They worked together for several years on this technology, and then the large company decided to terminate the joint development agreement and then file patents on the small company's inventions. Um, I've heard, I've heard numerous, numerous stories kind of along these lines where you know, a large company will try to take advantage of basically their, their legal strategies and financial might in order to bully small companies around. The second is that patents create an opportunity for opportunistic litigation. Patents are a right to exclude others from undertaking certain activities, and so a patent granted incorrectly could become a tool for basically going after legitimate businesses and trying to get them to, to, pay, to pay small amounts as a result of the cost of litigation rather than, some, rather than actual innovation. So the goal of a good patent system, especially when it comes to a new technology, is to try to get as much of the good while avoiding, while avoiding the bad. And this generally comes in the form of making sure that patents are issued in, um, under correct standards and in, in ways that ultimately promote innovation. So let's look at a couple of case studies um, I'm going to look at four of them. The first is um, the computer industry overall. The second is medical technology. The third is 3D printing. And the fourth, um, interoperability protocols. With regard to the first, computer and internet technology, this is probably the one that most people have heard of in terms of criticisms of the patent system recently. Um, the idea that there are these software patents on very basic computer ideas and that you know, so-called patent trolls have taken off these patents and are going around harassing small companies using them. So, so what exactly happened that gave rise to this? Well, what happened was that in the late 90s, early 2000s, the patent office really didn't understand computer technology. They didn't have access to the right sort of information to know what was new and what was not. And as a result, we ended up with a bunch of patents that really were granted on ideas that weren't very interesting or were fairly old. Um, it was really this lack of, patent, of expertise combined with you know, fairly substantial incentives to obtain patents that could be used against um, small companies in, in a variety of ways that led to a, a glut of patents on the software industry that contributed ultimately very little value except to those who were able to use them for litigation purposes. In a lot of other industries, we're starting to see the same sort of pattern. Um, I've, got a, I've got a clever picture of a chain of blocks, um, in case any of you are familiar with that. Um, blockchain technology is, of course, one of, the, one of the new big platform technologies. And something I, I went to a conference, and something that people had been observing is that a lot of the big banks are now applying for lots and lots of patents on blockchain technologies, not actually technological improvements, but largely just applications of blockchain technology to various, um, various purposes. And you know, there, there's a real question of whether or not, again, the patent office understands how this technology works, what its potential applications are, um, and is evaluating those sorts of patent applications correctly. Um, 
in, a, in, in the area of pharmaceutical and medical devices, I think we've seen kind of the opposite story, where the patents, you know, I, I think that there are a lot of good criticisms about how the pharmaceutical industry has used patents. But by and large, people agree that the patents that are issued tend to be fairly good, especially on lead innovator products. Why have they not experienced the same problem that the software industry has? I think the answer is that it's fairly easy to tell what a molecule is, and it's fairly easy for the patent office to evaluate that sort of thing. They have the expertise. They have scientists who actually understand chemistry. And they've done a fairly good job as a result. Um, those have largely dealt with uh, what I call after the, uh, after the major breakthrough sorts of patents. So with computers, the basic computer technology and basic internet technology, that was actually available largely for free because the inventors of the internet decided that they didn't want to obtain patents on the technology. And these were follow-on patents that dealt with uses of the technology. But then what happens if we look at patents that show up at the very, very beginning of an emerging technology? 3D printing, I think, is an interesting area in that respect. Um, a lot of you have probably heard about 3D printing as a fairly new technology. Um, there are lots of new startups coming out. Consumer 3D printers are, are, are showing up all over the place. Um, this is a graph of just scholarly articles on 3D printing. And you'll see there's a huge spike you know, around 2011 on. And I think this is interesting because 3D printing technology was invented in the 1980s. Companies, the, the companies that invented it obviously obtained fairly substantial patents on the technology and largely viewed it as a commercial technology. Didn't really think about expanding it into the consumer market. And as a result, it took until the patents expired largely for that wave of consumer innovation um, that we're seeing today to show up. Now, in a sense, this is unfortunate because it does mean that there was a delay of 20 years in innovation. But on the other hand, that's kind of what a patent is supposed to do. So one wonders, is there a way that we can have our cake and eat it too, where somebody can get patents that you know, promote their, their ability to invent, um, but then also make sure that others who want to come into the field have, have the opportunity to do that without the friction of licensing or dealing with large companies. In the space of communication protocols, I think we've seen a really wonderful example of how that's worked out. There have been plenty of patents in the communications in, in the, in the field of communication protocols, such as wireless networking and USB. Um, I've done a fair amount of studying of these patents. Why has it been so easy for these technologies to develop, despite the fact that there are a lot of patents in the field? And it's because there are good procedures for licensing them. They arose largely coincidentally, because communication protocols have to be standardized. So the, the firms who deal with standardization of those protocols decided, we'll also deal with the patent licensing issues. And they, had, they came up with agreements um, among the companies who were involved. And I think you know, that's really contributed to the fact that we simultaneously have, a, have good patent protection on the technologies, but also have a fairly frictionless system for licensing them and getting the technologies out there so that future innovators are able to, um, are able to, to build upon what's, what's already been created. So what are some lessons that we can take away for quantum computing um, and quantum innovation as a result of these, of these case studies? Well, so the first um, that I'd like to look at is, you know, what do we do about this early stage slowdown? There is a similar potential in quantum computing that you know, Google could, get the, could invent the first uh, large, large scale quantum computer and get a patent on it, and nobody else would be able to use it for, for a fair amount of time. Licensing strategies would be fairly important in trying to deal with this sort of thing in the same way that they were for communication protocols. But with quantum computing, we don't have the same need for standardization bodies to get involved who might help solve the friction problems with licensing. So is there another way that we can do this? I think one thing that will be very relevant are the national security concerns that are at play. Because of the fact that there is a need for the United States to continue innovating in quantum computing, it might be ultimately in the national interest for us to look at ways of trying to develop licensing practices or consortia or something like that. That would, that would ultimately help um, companies who need to license patent technologies to be able to do so more easily. Um, a second thing to consider is that with technologies such as the internet, such as blockchain, um, the, the basic platforms of those technologies were developed without patents, largely because they, they came about through academic research. So there is a lot of value in just the open, the open innovation model that's been used in academia um, in a lot of other fields. 
A second question is, what should the patent office be doing? As I mentioned before, a lot of the issues with software patents came about because the patent office simply didn't have expertise in the field. How can we make sure that with this new technology, the patent office does? There are a couple of answers, I think, to that. The first is that the patent office does actually invite experts into, um, into their halls and asks scientists to train examiners on new technologies. I think this is an important thing for them to be doing. And it's an important thing for, for the scientists and engineers in the community to be going out to them and teaching them about what the technical field really looks like. Um, a, second, a second issue that uh, we've been dealing with for a long time is simply what are the resource constraints on patent examiners? Patent examiners are reported to have between 17 and 35 hours to examine a patent application. Often these examiners are recent college grads with less than five years of experience. They're not especially technically knowledgeable. Are there ways that we, inc we can increase their technical knowledge? Are there ways that we can increase their credentials? Are there ways we can just give them more time to look at um, patent examinations and, or patent applications in certain situations? Um, one of the other things that patent examiners need in order to examine patent applications, they need the technical literature, the prior art that tells examiners what's new and what's old. With the computer field, because so much of that prior art was just in software boxes or in academic articles, but not in patent applications that had been filed, the patent office was really at a loss for knowing what was actually out in the field. Are there ways that we can get more information, especially in the quantum computing field, before the patent office, before they start looking at these applications without, you know, without a good sense for what the field looks like? Um, and finally, for, for those who are innovating in the field, are there things that that um, the engineers can be doing in order to try to, to try to prevent the problems that we've seen in the past and ultimately make the patent system um, as effective as possible in the field of quantum computing. I think one of the things is there's this real corporate drive to let patenting um, drive the innovation process. I really think that that's somewhat backwards. I, I remember from my practice many experiences where I was just sitting in a room with three or four engineers just coming up with ideas to patent. Not ideas that they were actually going to, going to create, but just because the corporation needed to hit certain numbers in terms of, um, in terms of patent counts. Uh, I think that that's, that's fairly unfortunate. And it should be important for, for engineers to be telling companies, look, we should be letting the innovation be driving, um, be driving our intellectual property strategy and not the other way around. Um, the second is that there are a lot of different forms of IP. As, um, as we know, there are patents, there are copyrights. Trade secrets, I think, will be incredibly important in the quantum computing field because a lot of the implementations of systems will probably be secret because of national security concerns. Um, and so companies that are concerned about their technologies getting out to other countries, for example, Patent protection, where you're required to disclose the entirety of how your invention works, may not be the best form of protection. Um, so I think that it'll be fairly important to look at the entire scope of the intellectual property universe. Um, and the final, the final thing is a message that you know I've been um, I've been giving to a lot of different groups is just um, for those who are applying for patents, try to get good ones. Um, I think that there are enough there are enough patent lawyers out there who recognize that a poorly written confusing patent can be fairly valuable because nobody understands what it says and as a result you can kind of say whatever whatever you want it to say. Um, I, can, I can understand this from the point of view of a litigator, but I can't understand it from the point of view of the public. And I can't understand it from the point of view of an inventor who probably wants to be able to go to inventor or go to investors and show them, look, we've gotten this patent on this really crucial technology and you can read it and you can understand what we're doing. Um, I think that it's it's really incumbent on a lot of the, the inventors to push back um, to a certain extent and demand that you know they can they actually get patents on the technology that they're inventing and that are clear that's you know actually advance the state um, the, the state both of their their own inventions but of policy overall. Um, I'm going to leave it at that and am looking forward to the remainder of the presentations. Thank you. What we're going to do, thank you, Charles. What we're going to do is we're going to save Q and A until all our speakers are done, so we can save time and really help to sort of generate an overall discussion that reflects all the different presentations, perspectives we're going to be hearing in the course of the in the course of our afternoon. Now, our second speaker, Stephen Ezel, 
is Vice President Global Innovation Policy at the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation, ITIF. He focuses on science and technology policy, international competitiveness, trade, manufacturing, and services issues. Before he was at ITIF, uh, Mr. Edsel worked at Peer Insight, an innovation research and consulting firm he co-founded in 2003 to study the practice of innovation in service industries. Uh, before that, he worked in the new service development group at the NASDAQ stock market, where he spearheaded the creation of the NASDAQ market intelligence desk and the NASDAQ corporate services network. Uh, he also pre co-founded two successful innovation ventures, the high-tech services firm Brevo Systems and Lynx Capital. He's the co-author of Innovating in a uh, Service-Driven Economy. That came out with Paul Gray Macmillan in 2015. And Innovation Economics, The Race for Global Advantage, Yale 2012. And as I think you'll tell from that title of that work, as well as the other work that, uh, uh, that Mr. Hazel has done in this area, you know, he's an important and valuable uh, addition to our panel today. May I introduce uh, Stephen Ezell. <coughs> well, thank you, Arthur, and to the Hudson Institute and the Federal Society for the invitation to be with you this afternoon. Uh, as Arthur said, I'm Stephen Ezell. I'm the Vice President of Global Innovation Policy at the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation. We're a Washington, D.C.-based nonprofit, nonpartisan science, technology, and economic policy think tank whose mission is to advocate for policies that drive innovation-based growth across the global economy. Today, I'd like to address three topics. First, the importance of intellectual property rights to quantum computing. Second, looking at some international trend in quantum computing patenting and publications. And finally, uh, looking at what countries are trying to do to achieve national quantum computing leadership. Arthur and Charles talked eloquently about the importance of intellectual property rights to innovation. Uh, they raise the private rate of return closer to the social rate of return from innovative activity, and in so doing, incent innovators to undertake the expensive, risky, and uncertain process of investing in new technologies because they can capture a gain, uh, appropriate a gain of their innovation activities. I'd also add critically for innovation based industries that intellectual property rights are vital to ensure a virtuous cycle of innovation, such that companies can take the profits generated from one generation of innovation to finance investment in the next. So life sciences companies depend upon the profits from one generation of drugs to invest in the future. Semiconductor companies depend upon the profits from the 16 nanometer line to fund the eight nanometer line to fund the next generation of quantum computing. So they're vital for a virtual cycle of innovation. And I think it's also important to recognize that innovation-based industries are distinct from others in three other fundamental ways. First, they compete not by making a copy of a generic drug or are making an automobile more efficiently, but they're fundamentally about companies inventing new to the world, next generation products or services, a new form of quantum computing, a new biologic drug, a new film or movie. Second, they're characterized by very high initial fixed cost of design and development, but lower incremental cost of marginal production. In other words, it can take up to $8 billion to make a new semiconductor fab, but that semiconductor chip comes off the line at marginal cost. $3.2 billion to make a biologic drug, yet you can make copies for free virtually. And finally, they fundamentally depend upon the embodiment of intellectual property. So quantum computing software depends on source code. Biologic drugs depend on molecular compounds. And because of these three distinct characteristics of innovation-based industries, if we want innovation to flourish to the maximum extent possible across the global economy, three conditions must attain. First, we have to ensure that companies have access to large global markets across which they can recoup the very high upfront fixed costs they incur. Second, we must ensure that governments compete not by introducing excess non-market-based competition in the global economy. 
In other words, countries should compete by funding scientific research, not by China saying, here's $3 billion for the next AI or quantum computing company to go out and compete in global markets directly against uh, market-based companies. And finally, we have to put in place systems globally that protect intellectual property and also create incentives and systems domestically, like with pre-competitive research consortium, like with Symatech in the semiconductor sector, where we have mechanisms that companies can come together in collaborative consortia to uh, develop pre-competitive R&D that leads to intellectual property that's shared across an ecosystem. We haven't really said much about quantum computing. I'll let my fellow panelists <laughs> try and describe it uh, in more detail. But essentially, right, it is about leveraging principles of quantum mechanics, notably the principles of superposition and entanglement, in order to create quantum computers that are potentially millions of times faster and more powerful than current computers. In fact, it's estimated that a 100 qubit quantum computer could hold in itself more storage capacity than all the hard drives that exist in the world today. And why quantum, computer, quantum computing leadership matters vitally for nations is because the past emergence of new computing architectures led to an industrial and regional shift in where global computing leadership resides. So if you think about it, when we had the emergence of the mini computer in the 1970s, leadership shifted to Boston with companies like DEC and Digital and Wang. Then when we had the personal computing revolution in the 80s and 90s, leadership shifted to the West Coast in California and Seattle. The point is, as we move to a completely new form of computing architecture, quantum computing, global computing leadership is essentially up for grabs again. And it's going to be the societies that marshal the optimal set of resources in terms of funding, talent, university research, and commercialization that lead in this transition again. That is what is at stake across the global economy. Also, it's important to recognize that quantum computing will become a foundational input that determines the competitive capacity of every single downstream industry and economy that uses this computing application. So we need to lead in quantum computing if we want, in the future, our life sciences companies, our manufacturers, our energy technology innovators to have the capacity to innovate to the best extent possible. It'll be a source of high value jobs and output and exports for the US economy. And finally, it will have immense national security implications. Uh, China recently said that they have deployed a stealth radar that can detect the quantum signature of our stealth aircraft. And they're also working on systems that can use quantum sensing to detect the location of submarines under the oceans. So absolutely vital for economic competitiveness and national security. Oops. So up until 2015, the United States was pretty clearly, along with China, a leader in global quantum computing patenting uh, in terms of quantum computing, quantum cryptography, and quantum sensors. However, what has changed since 2014 is that given researchers' better ability to control qubits and develop quantum computers, there has been a massive increase in global quantum computing patenting since the year 2014 as quantum computing-related patent publications increased 430%, and patent applications for uh, 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 applications of quantum computing, like sensing, cryptography, communications, increased by 470%. Driving this growth, in particular, has been China, which is shown here in orange. Since 2013, the number of quantum information technology publications uh, from China increased by 750%. And when we look at it in terms of applications, and now China is shown here in, in blue, uh, they have introduced three times as many patent applications uh, since 2013. And as the research company Patent Informatics LLC states, North American organizations may lead the development of the quantum computer itself, but Asian countries especially will lead in applications of quantum computing. I'll skip that. So what does this mean for countries? Uh, as Martin will talk about uh, Canada's experience, a number of countries around the world have put in place very clear national quantum computing leadership strategies, Australia, Canada, Germany, China, the United Kingdom, the European Commission. I think it's important to understand that China does represent a significant competitor to the United States here. Uh, they have made it, quote, a clear national initiative to surpass the United States in quantum computing leadership within a decade. They've recently announced the development of a $10 billion, 4,000 square foot 
National Laboratory for Quantum Information Science Research Institute in Haifa. And they are leaders in the world in both quantum cryptography and quantum communications, including now building a 2,000 kilometer long quantum communications pathway between Shanghai and Beijing, and leading in the deployment of quantum communications satellites and satellite to ground quantum networks. Uh, our friends in Europe are also focused on this. The European Commission has launched a $1.2 billion EU flagship initiative on quantum technologies and developed a European quantum technologies roadmap. Uh, probably the most sophisticated strategy in the entire world is the recently announced UK National Quantum Computing Technologies Program, which will invest $337 million to develop four hubs of quantum computing excellence in sensing and metrology, imaging, communications, and computing. Uh, they talk in that plan about the need to develop, quote, a UK quantum-ready workforce, and they are uh, funding curriculum development and PhD programs at universities around the United Kingdom to make that cap happen. They also have this really cool thing called the UK Quantum Innovation Fund, uh, which offers up to $200,000 prizes uh, to British companies who are using quantum computing to drive innovative uh, applications within their industries. So what is the United States doing? Uh, in recent years, the United States has invested about $200 million a year in a variety of quantum information science programs at institutions and agencies like DARPA, DOE, NIH, et cetera. Uh, but to date, we have not had any kind of coordinated national strategy for quantum computing. Uh, to address this, in fact, this Thursday, uh, the, the House will vote on the National Quantum Computing Initiative Act. Uh, it passed unanimously out of the relevant House committee earlier this summer. Uh, but the act would create a national quantum computing coordination office for the United States, as well as uh, direct federal agencies to invest up to $1.275 billion in quantum information science research and development over the next five years, including developing a series of national quantum information science research centers. Uh, to our minds at ITIF, this is absolutely vital. We need to make quantum computing a national priority for the United States and start to get more synergy and coordination in the activities that are going on across the various federal agencies so that we can lead in the development and the deployment of these technologies going forward. So in conclusion, quantum computing represents a fundamentally transformative platform technology that's going to impact the competitiveness and innovation capacity of every single industry across the US economy we cannot assume that leadership is our birthright, that we will lead if we take things for granted. And uh, all countries have to make national quantum uh, computing uh, leadership a national priority. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen. Um, I'm happy to say that Stephen mentioned the uh, national Quantum Initiative Act, that uh, the Quantum <laughs> Alliance Initiative has been part and parcel of that process, as have certain other members of, of, our, uh, of our panel and also in the audience in helping to shop, shape that uh, initiative and in order to help to get it off the ground. And as I described in a recent Forbes.com column that I did on the act, uh, although it's by no means the last word on quantum, technology and getting America quantum ready and getting us caught up where we need to be in this vital technological area, it's a hugely important first step uh, and definitely one which uh, needs both following up and also follow through on the part of Congress and White House and other government agencies as well. Speaking of that act, uh, the third member of our panel has also been part of that same initiative and direction and that's Chris Monroe. He's chief scientist at IONQ and professor of physics uh, at the University of Maryland. After graduating from MIT, Chris earned his PhD in physics in 1992 from the University of Colorado. He's a leading atomic physicist and quantum information scientist and dis demonstrated the first quantum gate in any system at National Institute of, S of Standards and Technology in the 1990s. I'll let Chris explain to you what quantum gate is all about, what's involved. Now at the University of Michigan and then at the University of Maryland, he discovered new ways to scale trap ion qubits and simplify their control with semiconductor chip traps, simplified lasers, 
and photonic interfaces of long distance entanglements. Uh, and I've gone up to see the work that IonQ has done up at the University of Maryland to visit the quantum computer there. And let me tell you, it's very impressive and very spectacular. And we're very fortunate to have both IonQ and University of Maryland on the cutting edge, our neighbors, on the cutting edge of this development of this technology. And we're likewise honored and privileged to have Chris to come speak to us this afternoon. Please welcome Chris Monroe. Thank you, Arthur, for the generous introduction and also uh, for the Hudson Institute and the Federal Society for having this panel and, and me part of it. Um, so in fact, um, very recently I've uh, taken over as CEO of, of INQ as we, uh, we've been a little bit heads down last last few years and we're going to start to, you're going to start to hear a little more about the hardware we're developing. And so I can give you a little bit of a perspective from both a, a small business uh, side and the university side of this field. So um, uh, we'll, we'll start with the second order perturbative expansion of the non-relativistic uh, Schrodinger wave equation. To, to <laughs> actually, it, it's, um, the great thing about quantum information science to me is that it, it in a sense, makes the whole topic easier. The way quantum physics is taught at universities is so esoteric and overly unnecessarily mathematical. Um, uh, the structure of the atom, how solids behave. When you, when you use information as the, as the root, uh, as the fundamental element in quantum, it just is a little bit easier. We, we're fun, we, we are familiar with bits, zeros, or ones. And in quantum, we have zeros and ones, superpositions. And the way you add quantum bits, so-called so qubits together, um, it, it's great because it's not just physics anymore. It becomes computer science, mathematics, information theory, chemistry. It's much broader than just physics. So. Um, uh, when I teach quantum to physicists, I teach it from that perspective. And there is math involved, but you know, there's math in a lot of things. It doesn't necessarily add to your understanding. Okay, so enough on that. Um, I did. I do want to comment a little bit on, um, you know, the tension. Maybe that's too strong of a word uh, uh, in this field. And um, I see it from both sides because I think this tension stems from the fact that at universities we're comfortable with the concepts of quantum physics, even if we don't quite understand them in the end. And we're in good company not understanding them because Einstein never accepted them, in fact. We use them. We're comfortable using them. We don't worry about that. Um, the problem is, at universities, we don't build things. Well, I'm an experimental physicist. I certainly build things, but it's with glue and tape, and I need a bunch of PhDs to tweak every little knob to make it work. And then um, one rule of publishing science is that uh, the data is always really bad because you've pushed the system as far as it can go, so it's just barely visible. But to build a system, that word system, something that can be used by a third party without PhDs, that's what we need in this field. Uh, after all, any computer is useful because it's, you don't have to know what's inside. The, the smartphone is the best example of that. Who, who knows or cares? Somebody should care what's inside, but the user shouldn't have to care, and that makes it useful. So universities, we're comfortable with the fundamentals of the, these types of devices, but we don't build things. And when we go, when we go to industry, the crown jewel of, of the US, in my opinion, especially how it will play out in this field, industry builds things. But there's a little bit of a culture problem because they're not, they're not in tune with the fundamentals of quantum physics. Why should they be? And some of them, even at highest levels, don't even believe it. It's, there's certain mysticism associated with it. Um, and my approach there is always just get over it. I mean, it, it's right. It's been tested um, more accurately than any other theory in all of history. So get over it. Uh, accept it. Use it. It can be useful. So there's a little bit of a tension. And I, I think this um, leads to a workforce issue. Maybe, maybe that's obvious to you. Where does, where does Intel or Microsoft, where do they hire people to build something? Um, you need engineers that are, that, are, that are mature. They have experience building systems that, that take a life of their own. I, I often compare it to the building of a, 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 big, a big jet airline or, or a jet fighter. That's an incredibly complicated system. No one person can understand every piece of it. Um, and this is what industry does best. They do systems engineering. They, they, they understand that aspect. And this is going to this is going to play huge roles in in uh, the building of quantum technology in the future. 
Um, so, uh, I, uh, as Stephen mentioned, the National Quantum Initiative, yes, I, I've been intimately involved with a large, a few dozen uh, folks across the country uh, from, from academic institutes and centers to uh, industrial leaders, uh, the, from the behemoths down to startups, to, to help Congress write potential legislation that apparently will be, will be voted on very soon. And it attacks this workforce issue by establishing, um, by establishing very focused centers, and only a few of them. It's not divide by N funding as usual, where you cut everything down to the bare bone and, and you, you get basically a lot of nothing. I hope I'm not quoted on that. But, um, but in this field, it's, 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 it's advanced far enough that we can identify a few areas that really need to develop a workforce. And by having industry play with universities, uh, our national laboratory system in both the Department of Defense, Department of Energy, uh, and the other agencies, um, th th they're great playgrounds to, 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 to invent a future workforce that can eventually be deployed uh, in industry in the long run. Now, regarding IP issues, um, which is the focus of this, of, of this session, um, I'm certainly not an expert. I will say I know infinitely more than I did five years ago. As a startup funded by venture capital, uh, uh, unfortunately, we, we do need to, to uh, establish a vital IP portfolio. And I say unfortunate. I mean, it, it's good that we do this for our protection. But it's unfortunate also, and I think uh, Charles mentioned this, that, that it's the currency of companies, you know, a check mark. How many, how many patents do you have in this field? Um, what's inter what I've learned about uh, patenting, a couple of things. One, maybe this is obvious to those of you that have thought more about this than me, but the most useful patents are the ones you certainly don't anticipate until you build the thing and you figure out you know, exactly what's important. You may keep them as trade secrets, that's true. But those patents, it's very hard to, in advance, see exactly what, you know, what, what, uh, what, the, you know, what the best space is to pursue uh, patent protection. <laughs> the other thing I'll say is that um, because this field is so tied to, to the US academic system at universities, unfortunately, universities don't quite get it. Uh, and it makes sense. Their mission is not to make money and to have businesses. Their mission is education. But in this field in particular, uh, m much of the progress is driven by university research. And universities, they don't have staffs to, to, to uh, maintain uh, patents, to prosecute them, and to license them, and, and maybe come up with, with uh, future investments to keep them up to date. Um, and actually, this, um, this is a little unfortunate. Uh, it, it, it's a very high level discussion here. but. Many corporations have gone, have partnered with universities abroad because of the different patent laws in different countries. And, and uh, that, that really is unfortunate because we have the industry. And we want our industry to partner with our universities and uh, generate our you know, workforce that is American. Um, now, uh, also it was mentioned, I think, I, I think uh, uh, Charles mentioned the, the issue of standardization. My own opinion is even though this field's about 20 years old, it's still way too early to think about standards. It's sort of like um, going back in time to 1950 and seeing the first transistor and saying, boy, let's, let's, uh, let's patent uh, high-level software that can program billions of these transistors. Well, it, it, there's all kinds of innovation that has to happen before standards make sense. Um, on the other hand, I, uh, as, as Arthur mentioned, I do come from NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology. I spent 10 years there. Uh, a while ago. And um, it, it's interesting in this field, NIST has, is really the one agency that has been there all along in this field, has innovators, has four Nobel Prizes in this field um, between Boulder and Gettysburg, Maryland here. Um, and they continue to be very vital um, in this field. And I think as, we, as this field matures, we need to keep our eye on standardization. The Semitech model, I think, was mentioned. We're not, re we're not ready for that. Um, but at some point, quantum technology is going to advance so far that IP and, and uh, being uh, you know, defensive about your IP and so forth is going to be an impediment to progress. You're going to have different companies trying to build the same thing and reinventing the wheel. So this is where um, a Semitech model might come into play, where companies can come together in a consortium style uh, 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 collaboration and sort of develop standards for the betterment of both companies. And, I think NIST will be ready to do that when, it, when we're ready for it. I'm not sure we are yet, but I, I think uh, it's good that the agencies, the agency that, that would be in charge of that is so well engaged in this field. 
Um, so I guess um, I guess I'll, I'll I'll quit, but I, I I'll, I'll stop by saying that quantum technology. I didn't talk much about the applications, but we've heard a little bit of their overlap with security issues, and this goes both ways. You may have heard that quantum computers can hack, they can break codes. Um, unfortunately, this problem is really far away because it requires systems that are way bigger than we can even think of in the next five years. It's hard to predict in this field, but. I would make a prediction that's way, way more than five years before we can, we can break public key encryption systems. However, um, quantum technology impacts the other side of security, and that is encryption in order to maintain security in, in the signals you do send. And one of the one of the leading one of one of the fundamental tenets of quantum is that um, data that you store in a quantum variable uh, only exists when you don't look at it. That's actually that's that's the way I think of quantum mechanics in a way. And so that offers protection. If, somebody, if an eavesdropper uh, is trying to read your signal, you can tell fundamentally. And so they're very interesting aspects in terms of direct communication there. But I think um, one of the more important applications of, of encryption is that when we have big quantum computers that can solve problems that are impossible to solve any other way, they'll be available on the cloud. Because you may have guessed that these quantum computers are going to be pretty exotic hardware. It'll be like mainframes in the 1960s. You're not going to have one in your living room, uh, certainly not, not, on your, not on your wrist anytime soon. You're going to execute instructions to some cloud. But due to, um, again, the features of quantum, you can upload instructions without anybody knowing what you're running. Um, this is very interesting. Um, and I think some people feel different ways about that. But being able to, uh, if you're Goldman Sachs, for instance, and you want to run some financial model, uh, but you don't want to give up what that financial model is, are you going to trust your cloud server? Well, you don't have to, because you can send quantum instructions to the quantum computer and then <coughs> run and then get the results. So security will always play a role in this field. But I think even before we get to uh, those long-term applications, um, you know, what I lose sleep over uh, as CEO at INQ, I don't lose sleep over our ability to perform as, as leading technology. I lose sleep over the fact that we still don't know what the killer app of quantum computing is as an entire field. Um, and that makes it exciting on the one hand, very risky uh, on the other hand. Um, and certainly, we've heard all the noise from across the world, from, uh, from, from countries. Uh, we heard about the UK and, and Chinese investments and the US. Again, we have, we have the mighty industry here and the mighty university system. And I think with this National Quantum Initiative that hopefully <clears throat> by the end of the year, we'll see some action on will stimulate um, uh, much more activity here. And of course, intellectual property will, will, uh, will continue to, um, to play an important part as we bring this, the, 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 this research and development from university and academics to, to industry where it can be useful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, Chris Monroe raised the question about quantum workforce, which is actually one of the issues that the Quantum Alliance Initiative here at Hudson is very much interested in, both from a national perspective as well as an international perspective, as you'll see from the article, which I have printed out there from Forbes.com about the challenges that we face in terms of building workforce, not just in terms of workforce in terms of employees, but also even just at the basic research level. But Char but. Chris did pose the question rhetorically, sort of, you know, where does Intel and Google, Microsoft, where do they get their workforce? Well, what I can tell you is, a little secret a lot of people don't know, that a lot of that workforce comes from University of Waterloo in Ontario. And our last panelist is someone who is, uh, uh, shall we say, born and bred in that cabbage patch, who knows the ecosystem of the University of Water uh, Ontario, the Institute for Quantum Computing, and the whole development in Quantum Valley that has taken place and has grown so uh, amazingly in Canada over the last decade, which we'll be talking about in our next conference on October 16th. Um, now, Martin LaForest is Senior Business Development Manager uh, in, in Quantum Technology at ISARA Corporation, which is the leading uh, security solutions company dealing with uh, production-ready quantum-safe cryptography, uh, where companies and agencies and organizations such as NIST are now looking 
for ways in which to prevent uh, and to hedge against uh, quantum computer penetration of our leading uh, public encryption systems. Uh, Dr. LaForest has more than 15 years experience in raising awareness about the benefits and threats of quantum technologies. And he plays a central role in helping ISARA's technological partners uh, and customers understand how the advent of quantum computing will force them to reshape their data and network security. Now, prior to joining ISARA, um, Dr. LaForest was the head of scientific outreach at the, at the Institute of Quantum Computing at the University of Waterloo. Um, and he's done a great deal of work there uh, within the Quantum Valley uh, technology ecosystem, but also in terms of outreach with other uh, institutions in other countries in dealing with both the benefits and also the risks involved in quantum technology. He holds a PhD in physics, specializing in experimental quantum information. And it's uh, uh, a great pleasure, uh, as always, to have uh, Martin LaForest on the dais with us and to hear him talk about the rela relations of IP and of quantum technology from a Canadian's perspective. Martin. Thank you, Arthur, for the kind introduction. Always nice to be here in Washington and working with the Huston Institute. And thank you as well for the Federal Society for inviting me. Uh, so it's been very American-centric. Uh, I was not expecting anything less uh, coming here. Uh, so I feel a little bit like the, you know, the, the, the guy from the north coming and trying to tell you, the big guys, how to do things. This is not, this is not of course, my, uh, my goal. But uh, I've been invited here to talk a little bit about what we call Quantum Valley. Uh, based in the region of Waterloo in Canada, and, and also to, uh, to talk about uh, the very unique intellectual property uh, policy that the University of Waterloo has, which we believe played a big role in the innovation ecosystem, and then will play a big role into this uh, quantum uh, valley ecosystem that we're trying to build, or this vision we're trying to implement. Uh, so here in my, my co-panelists, uh, I have about an hour worth of comments I would like to, uh, to go around. There's a wealth of information. A uh, couple of things I'd like to mention, maybe before uh, diving into my presentation, is uh, just maybe following up to uh, Professor Monroe on uh, the importance of academic and industry uh, partnership, as well as you know Not for long. national uh, partnership between uh, United States, Canada, and uh, other nations. Is that this is a huge adventure? Where it's a big endeavor that we're all in it. It, it can transform society, really transform the way uh, you know, we live in the future. And, uh, you know, I started this whole thing maybe about 15 years ago where we were just having fun in the lab. Like, it was a cool thing. Yeah, we're, you know, we're coming up with important application to get funding, but really it was just a science project. F fast forward 15 years later, I mean, the advances that we've done has just been astonishing. You know, yes, I started as a young, innocent man, and then I thought, you know, I was looking at the future. But now, 15 years later, I'm a bit older, lost a few hair. I'm like, wow, we've done tremendous effort from a scientific perspective, but also from a technological perspective. And just in the last few years, we've seen, like, the big behemoth of, uh, of, te of tech coming on board. You know, the IBMs, the Googles, uh, the Intel. And I think where that relationship is becomes very important. Well, first of all, you know, Dr. Herman mentioned most of those people hire from universities. Uh, I lost many, many friends. I don't have any people to play golf anymore in Waterloo because they're all down at, at Google or at, uh, at IBM. Uh, but my perspective on this is that you know, those big companies, a private sector, is really good at building, at, at scaling things up in a rough, not so great way. And what I mean by this, they can build you know, big systems and then Dean that Rodney. kind of work. So he's the last speaker. So he's right. Well, uh, who's talking to me now? <laughs> and uh, as opposed to uh, academics, which are really good at building small stuff, but really, really well. Right? So you know, maybe until about 2012, 13, experimental quantum computing was mainly an academic thing. We were, we're building two qubits, three qubits, but they were like really good. 
now the big boys came in, uh, you know, came into play, and then you have Intel with 50 qubits, and Google with 72, and Rigetti with 128. So they, they, they build those chips, but they don't tell you how good or bad they are. Right? I mean, if you look at the, the specs, they don't tell you the specs. This is where that synergy comes in between the academics and, and, the, and the private sector, is that they can go out and scale things, while the academics can still figure out how to make them work in a good way. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a crude explanation, but I think this academic industry collaboration should keep on going for a long time. Anyway, that was, that was a little bit of a, of a side. Side step. So I wanted to talk about today about the University of Waterloo. So for those of you who might not know, uh, what, the Waterloo region, it's a, about a half a million uh, people. It's a fairly small region, about 120 kilometers, 80 miles, 75 miles. I don't speak your language, sorry, but something like that. Uh, an hour and a half drive west of Toronto. Uh, we're right in the middle of farm field. Uh, it's, uh, from Canadian standards, a fairly recent university where we were celebrating our 60 years, 60 years old uh, anniversary last year. Uh, so Canadian university tends to be like old and clunky, but University of Waterloo is fairly recent. And it was built out of necessity in the sense that the University of Waterloo came up because there was a need for engineers and mathematicians and insurance people. So Waterloo is, well, used to be, it's still farmland. And then, you know, farmers needed better equipment. So the idea of starting a university with an engineering, uh, you know, focus on engineering kind of makes sense. And then the idea of mutual insurance for, you know, insuring yourself against bad crops or good crops, that idea was developed in, in Waterloo out of the need for this. So from the get-go, University of Waterloo was always very practical focus, and still to this day. So we're a mid-sized university. Uh, but we have the second largest faculty of engineering in North America. Uh, we, we don't have a math faculty, but we don't have a math department, but we have a math faculty that specializes in cryptography, in computer science, in insurance, in uh, artificial intelligence. We also have the largest co undergraduate co-op program in the world, where 80% of our students are in a co-op program, so they do work term, school, work term, school. And there's a big emphasis on entrepreneurship. The entire town of Waterloo was built by entrepreneurs, and that keeps on, uh, you know, it's still part, it's part of the water in, in Waterloo, so that even our co-op students, there is a lot of infrastructure incubators to help undergraduates to build their own companies, and that's part of their co-op education. They can actually work one term for credit for their own company. So you can imagine often students come out of the university with a degree on one hand and you know, an incorporation on the other. So it's a very vibrant place when it comes to uh, startups. So I've been specifically asked to talk about the inventor-owned policy of the University of Waterloo. There's not much I can say. It's inventor-owned. That's it. It's like everything that is, so if you invent something as a University of Waterloo student or faculty member or researcher or postdoc, you own it. The university does not take a cut. Your typical deal at a university, in academic institutions, the university will own maybe 20%, 30%, sometimes all the way up to 100%. But it's fairly unique in North America. Uh, I don't think there's any other university, uh, no, large-scale university that has an inventor-owned policy. And that's been since day one. Because the whole idea, again, coming back to the reason of University of Waterloo, it was that it came out, out of a need to help the industry. So it was, um, so when you invent something, when you do your research, you have no obligation whatsoever to disclose, to share it with the university. You can partner with the university there's a commercialization office, so you can partner with the university to commercialize your intellectual property because you know, not all researchers, academic researcher, wants to become CEO of something, but sometimes they just want the idea to come out. Or you can go around on your own and go find your own funding or fund your company yourself. So you're completely free to do whatever you want. And then the idea behind it was to create a whole environment or you know a whole ecosystem of entrepreneurs so we want our academic researcher to do what they do best which is research but to also have a bit of an entrepreneurial entrepreneurial spirit so for example at the uh, at the institute for quantum computing which i used to work all the way until three months ago i uh, still act as an advisor so i'm kind of wearing two hats today 
Uh, a lot of our recent hire in quantum computing and quantum information are very much entrepreneurial. So they want to build things, they want to understand the science behind it, but they also want to build something practical and get it out of the lab. Um, so a result, a result of this, own, this uh, inventor-owned policy is that for the past 26 years, the University of Waterloo has been uh, named by McLean's, which is sort of the Canadian equivalent of the Times Magazine. Every year they do a ranking of the university on different categories. And for 26 years running, we've been deemed the most innovative university in Canada. So just to give you some numbers of the impact of this inventor-owned um, policy in, the universe, in, in Waterloo. So now keep in mind, Waterloo is a small region. so only about half a million people, but it's very, very active in terms of startups, spin-offs, and in the high tech sector. So at the moment, there's roughly 400 companies that directly depend, that are directly spin-off of the University of Waterloo. So in the region of Waterloo, there's 400 spin-off or startup companies that are coming straight out of the university. If we start counting outside of the University of Waterloo, then we go into thousands fairly easily. Uh, just another uh, number, for example, just out of the university, uh, out of the engineering, um, uh, faculty, there's uh, over 600 startups that are still existing today anywhere in the world that are coming directly either from students or faculty members uh, or staff uh, from the uh, university, uh, sorry, from the uh, engineering faculty. Uh, also within the region, kind of a, as a uh, spin-off of that, is that there's a lot of activity on the startup, uh, on the startup side or on incubators. There's something like nine different incubators. Uh, I'll focus on one called Communitech. Communitech is not really an incubator. It's sort of a, it's an everything about everything. So it's like your one-stop shop for, for companies. So it's a membership type uh, you know, of, of organization. They can help you grow your business. It's, it's a very Canadian model. So Communitech started 20 something years ago where all the tech companies and non-tech companies in Waterloo came together and they say, Let's stop competing with each other and let's try to learn from each other so we can all benefit and grow. So it's very Canadian. Instead of backstabbing each other, let's try to just play together and be nice and, and then learn from each other and help each other out. And it's kind of what they're, they're still doing today. So you have people from the two-person spin-off company to like the, you know, the, the Canadian Tires or the Deloitte that have innovation labs there. So anywhere from the small to the big. And they have you know, numbers that are, you know, you know, they're over 800 startups to get you know, their business model going and then connecting with investors and so on and so forth. Uh, so very entrepreneurial region. But how does that relate to uh, quantum computing? And I think this battery, there you go, whoa. Okay, so Quantum Valley is the, it's what we're trying to build at the university, in the Waterloo region. So. A lot that we've been hearing so far is about trying to build a quantum computer. Uh, Professor Monroe did mention, uh, no, actually, I think it was Stevens mentioned that people who build quantum computer, everything down the stream will have a huge impact as well. People are using a quantum computer, the different industry is going to be tagging along and so on and so forth. Uh, but, at, but in the Waterloo region, we believe that the opportunity is much bigger than this. It's not just about quantum computing. Like, yes, this is the moonshot. It, it, it's got revolutionary application. But the field, the quantum opportunity is much larger than this. You could have application from quantum sensors, information security, quantum materials. So what we are trying to build in Canada, in the Waterloo region, is a full innovation ecosystem that will allow us to build an industry around quantum and in all the potential opportunities, from computing to medical devices, to materials and, and, you, and things that we haven't discovered yet. So a couple of the, of the major player. So we have, for example, the Perimeter Institute, which is a theoretical physics think tank. Commercialization is not even on their radar. Like their, their motto is the theoretical physics of today is a technology of tomorrow. They just look at the big ideas, cosmology, particle physics, condensed matter theory. They're just you know, blackboards, chalk, and then let's go at it. Then you have the Institute for Quantum Computing, which is a lot more applied. So we still do fundamental science, but we also do prototyping, experimental research. 300 plus uh, scientists from PhD students to uh, faculty members looking at applications of quantum for practical technologies. 
And then you have places like uh, Quantum Valley Investment, where it's a venture capital fund that's solely focused on investing in potential companies that are building quantum technologies. Uh, there's also a whole bunch of programs that are aimed at accelerating research. For example, the transformative quantum technology, which has three main focus, building a quantum computer powerful enough that can demonstrate quantum supremacy, doing ultra-long distance quantum cryptography, and doing quantum sensors of practical for practical applications. Uh, we have Quantum Valley Ideas Lab, which is sort of a, you know, a, another project from to develop the prototype all the way to the a product that is ready to be commercialized. Already today, out of this ecosystem, we've been upward of 13 different startups and uh, startups and spin-off in all spheres of quantum technology. So from quantum software to hardware, sensors, security, even consulting. So 13 startups, it's, it's a fairly small number in the scope of things. But it's still, to this day, the largest concentration of startups in quantum anywhere that I can think of. So some of them are already on the market. I will take, for example, Quantum Benchmark. So if you've been following the news lately, Quantum Benchmark is a software company that built a software that directly helped the people trying to build the hardware. So when you build a hardware, there's errors. Their software allows you to study those errors and tell you how to properly do your operation to mitigate those errors. Also, they build a software that, if you use a quantum computer, and it gives you an answer, can you trust it? I mean, if you have a quantum computer that can outperform a classical computer, you use it, it gives you an answer, how can you be sure you have the right answer? You cannot check it because your computers are not good enough. So they've built a software that sort of gives you with what accurate, you know, how much trust you can put in those answers. So, for all the people trying to build a hardware, this is a very practical software. And they just signed a licensing agreement with Google not so long ago that when you use the online platform of Google to play with their quantum uh, hardware, you can use the quantum benchmark software. Uh, another example would be uh, iSera, which is a company I work with. So iSera, we are developing uh, you know, new, the, the new generation of cryptography protocol that will secure you against quantum attacks. So Professor Monroe said, you know, we won't have a quantum computer that will break security anytime soon, and I cannot disagree with this. But when you're looking at long-term security obligations, there are already today some systems that are already too late to upgrade. When you're talking about infrastructures that will be there for 30, 40, 50 years. When you're thinking about cars that's going to be on the road for the next 20 years. When you're talking about, I don't know, national security information that you don't want to leak anywhere else. Those are already things that are vulnerable for uh, no, are vulnerable to quantum computer uh, potential attack, and we need to secure them today. So the company Isera, we're not a spin-off of the University of Waterloo. We don't do quantum technology per se, but we are we are still part of this whole quantum ecosystem because for us, it made sense to build a comp to start a company in Quantum Valley where we have direct access to the University of Waterloo which have great cryptographers to the university, to the Institute for Quantum Computing, which have you no know, quantum expert. So we have several people on our staff that are coming from IQC and from the University of Waterloo. Um, so I will kind of stop there. What I wanted to talk about was uh, sort of this unique intellectual property policy that the University of Waterloo has and the impact it had on the region, both from the quantum technology future, but as well as creating that entrepreneurial sort of uh, ecosystem around the region. So thank you very much. Thank you, Martin. Um, we're going to leave as much generous time as we can for Q&A from the audience and so on. But of course, I get to ask the first question since I'm the moderator and host for this. And I have to tell you that ever since Charles's presentation, I've been thinking about one thing. And that was when Charles was talking about the way in which big companies can use patent and patent applications in order to bully and intimidate smaller companies or preempt uh, their moves into innovative fields. I was reminded about the famous vaudeville comic Eddie Cantor. You know, Cantor was a hugely successful Broadway actor, performer, a comedian. And every spring, Cantor would go on a nationwide tour across the United States. He would go and he'd drop in on the most promising young 
comedians and vaudeville performers that he could find, and he would uh, collect and take notes on the, the, the young men and women who were creating the most interesting and the funniest kinds of acts that were coming out. And he would go back to New York, and he would have his, his lawyer send each of those young performers a letter saying, uh, we have seen your act performed in Buffalo or in Muncie, Indiana, or in Minneapolis. And this is to let you know that Mr. Cantor has been doing the same act for years, uh, and that therefore, if you are to cease and desist ever performing this act again, or else we'll be forced to take legal action. So this is a perfect example of how you can, a big company can bully the small ones uh, by, uh, by preempting this. And this prompts then my question which is actually not for Charles, but for Stephen. When we look at this explosive growth of Chinese patents and applications within the quantum field, do we have a sense about what the overall strategy is this? Is this really, in a sense, a path towards innovation and a reflection of that path? Or how much of it is, in fact, a kind of preemptive strike, a way of showing, hey, China's really moving ahead in the quantum area, but we're also looking for ways in which we could bring future litigation if Western companies, including American companies, end up trying to develop the same kinds of technologies and applications. Uh, no, I think a, a similar question to the world of and, and part of that uh, uh, dynamic is prevailing upon China to be a good actor in the global economic and national property community. There's no doubt that you know over the past decade, even the Chinese government, and there are articles about this in the China, Chinese Journal of Science and Technology, where they've asked, they've instructed Chinese companies, go out into the world, scour every you know patent filing that exists, and figure out, oh, that's how you do it, and then you bring the technology back to China and create it here without respect for international national property rights. I think that's one part of their strategy. The second part of your strategy, is that you just alluded to, is by being aggressive in uh, uh, applying for uh, quantum computing patents across a number of international domains with the potential to use that as a blocking strategy uh, for future competitors that may arise. Uh, so you know, from our perspective, uh, it's important uh, both that we make our companies aware of what China's strategy has been around leveraging intellectual property to achieve leadership in advanced technology industries and prevail upon them that the way they compete broadly uh, must be predicated on enterprise-led market-based terms. Hmm. Very interesting. So we're going to open up the field to the questions to the audience. Um, we'll have uh, someone with a mic come around so that we'll all be able to hear your question. The only thing I'll ask you to do is, is to state your question in the form of a question, uh, to state your name, and then to give whatever affiliation you care to give at the same time. So we've got a question up here in the front to start. Thank you very much. This has been awesome. My name is Ann Vroom. My question is with regard to open source collaboration. Uh, it seems to be giving rise to new forms of licensure. Do you think that that approach will apply in, in the quantum field? I'll take a I'll take a first stab at this. Um, it's a it's an interesting question. I think that you know the the open source movement in the software field has been you know it, it's had very very interesting effects on the way that software has developed. You know I think that there were there were many years when it was just sort of seen that there was a battle between the proprietary companies and the open source companies, and now we're starting to see that there are some very interesting partnerships that can happen. IBM is taking up Linux as a core part of their their product strategy. Um, people are realizing that consulting on open source products is, is very effective. Um, one of the difficulties when it comes to you know, more hardware-based technologies, I guess, in a sense, is that the, um, the strategies that have made open source technology really work are copyright-based strategies, actually. They take advantage of the fact that there is copyright in a computer program. And basically license the copyright in ways that promote the interests of the open source community. When it comes to technologies like hardware, where the um, where copyright protection is not so obviously effective, and you know you're more relying on patents or trademarks, it's harder to apply the same strategies. I've worked for a while with um, with a group called the Open Source Hardware Association, 
And you know, I think that in just the field of you know regular computer hardware, they face um, they face very similar issues, and they've been looking at different ways of trying to promote that model um, through licensing or certifications or something like that. Um, but you know, I think there there definitely is interest um, in that in, in that possibility, and you know, I I can definitely see that as quantum computing develops, uh, both in the hardware and in the applications and software field. Uh, we'll probably see a variety of perspectives in terms of ways that people want to advance the fields, and it's going to be important in the same way that was important for software. That you know we're we're um, accommodating both of those different types of interests. I might add to that that um, one flexibility uh, we see in the field right now, if you look at the what we call the full stack from the user interface all the way down to the controller of the hardware, down to the nitty gritty of the hardware. Um, the hardware um, outfits, I mean, I, I, wearing my INQ hat, where, we're, where, where, where you can draw a line at where you open up the system. And right now it's fairly high. I think it, if, 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 if you abstracted away the, the hardware itself, then having uh, very open source at a very high level is great for the field. Because I'll, I'll tell you um, a fact that I'm not going to find the application for quantum computing. I'll build it. But I, it, it, it behooves us. Uh, uh, at the industrial level to open our system up. And IBM has certainly uh, led the charge in doing that. But as, as things mature, maybe maybe that line gets a little deeper. Maybe you open up. Maybe it gets higher. I, 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 don't, I don't really know. Yeah. And, and, and I've talked to, uh, to several of the, of the companies working on the hardware. And, uh, and then some of them actually have, have said, along with what uh, Professor Monroe was saying, is that there, there's a part where uh, it has not really any value for them from a, a monetary point of view. And also, they're not really good at it. So like, let's open source it, and then let people play with it, and maybe they'll solve it for us. <laughs> right? so, so it's a way to get work done at, at, at free cost. Uh, but, but also because, you know, I don't know, on the, on the compiler side, like is there, the compiler says how you go from the abstract down to the physical layer, is there really a value there? It, it's hard to say because it's, it's still an open scientific question. So they just toss it in the wild and say like, come up with something, and maybe there's a price at the end, but it's open source. So there's a value, but not a monetary value. There's like a practical value to it. Crowdsourcing. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. We have a question here on the side. Uh, thank you. Uh, Dave Rabinowitz. Uh, the first patent on a transistor was filed in 1925. The first successful transistor was made in 1947 and didn't even conform to the patent. The first transi successful transistor that conformed to the patent wasn't until 1957. Uh, nobody made any money on that patent. Is this likely to happen again with quantum, uh, quantum computing? And does, is that a good incentive for going open source? Well, well I, I just know that sometimes, just for fun, I'll go on Google's, uh, Google patent, just see what kind of things that's been patented. And this is just my gut reaction. Some of them are just, I think, ridiculous. It's almost I'm wondering if it's not just a contest of who files the most patents, just so they can say, I got the most patent. Uh, yeah, so that's my personal opinion. Some of them are definitely important. Uh, but I come from a bit the, um, so I, I don't work for a hardware company, and I haven't picked any winner, because I don't think any of the technology we're pursuing right now will be the winner, right? So it's, it's a good way forward. You have to go forward. But personally, I think people who are, are you know, patenting the screw on their Josephson Junction or whatever, might be a little too early in the game to do that. But that's my personal <laughs> non-patent lawyer <laughs> view of things. Oh, I, I add to that, and based on the noise in the field, I would say the answer is almost certainly yes. <laughs> Even outside of the IP and patent issues, just what you hear, I mean, 90% of it is, I mean, we, we have a problem in the field. It's so overhyped. There's a bubble that's blowing up right now. I hope it, <laughs> anyway, it's going to pop at some point, and hopefully we'll be able to survive that. Well, you know, I think um, there was something that you said earlier um, that a lot of times the, the real advantage contribution is some, is some like technical implementation detail that you hadn't really thought of at the very beginning. And I think that, that that's a really interesting indication. You know, a lot of times the, the very, very early thinking isn't really where you end up wanting to go. And it's the people who are you know, actually putting together the pieces of metal and figuring out what the technology should look like who actually make a lot of real inventive contributions that make this thing work. 
It'll also be interesting to see how this plays out between the quantum computing side, right, which is the computer itself, and then the applications that are running on the computer for mm -hmm. encryption, for communications, for sensing. Uh, you know, I think the technical challenge is how you control those qubits in a stable uh, state. Uh, and I, I imagine there will be a number of technical processes that will get to that solution over the long term, which uh, raises the question of how valuable any particular patent would be for a particular process that could be done in a different way, perhaps better. So. But it's the types. You have, you have a range of right. patents in a similar area of which one or two or th maybe three winners emerge over time. I'm not going to let that pass, however, what Chris just said about the quantum bubble. <laughs> um, and, I, and I mention this in, a, in the sense of, if to get, get your sense of where that bubble is and what's making it, but I just remind the audience that we went through what, what some people call an, a, a bubble in artificial intelligence in the 1990s when there was a lot of hype about what was going to happen with artificial intelligence. And you'd have you know, robot butlers who would be taking care of your meals and answering the door and so on. And then when people got disenchanted and realized <coughs> the big payoff wasn't going to be there, there was a loss of interest, drop in funding, drop in research in that area. And it took a, a long time for people to catch up. So a quantum bubble is not something, I mean, a, a bubble in, in technology and in technological innovation is definitely something that one wants to be alerted to. Do you want to say something more on that, well, where, yeah. where it sits? I didn't mean to sound so negative, because there's, it, it, look, there's a legitimacy, obviously, in this entire field. And the, the implications in the long run are they're simply staggering. Yeah. <laughs> they really are. Uh, I think you have, it's interesting what's happening, because we have lots of industry plays here. There's lots of money riding on it. Uh, there's lots of investment. And so there's an incentive to get out there and say things that aren't exactly, maybe they're more speculative, uh, what we have and so forth. And that, that is being promoted even by in academic circles. Um, and that's what I mean by the bubble. There, 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 there is definitely a hype cycle here, like most emerging technologies. Uh, You're thinking primarily on the idea of the quantum supremacy of what, of the race to get to the, to the yeah, quantum, quantum computer so that does that, and, and what, yeah. and, and that all the promise that supposedly lies behind that idea. Yeah, I mean, quantum supremacy, if you don't know what it is, it's, it's a, sort of an academic milestone uh, where you can prove that what you've done on your device could not be simulated classically. Somebody brought up, well, how do you, how do you actually do that? You, I actually come from atomic clock, uh, clockwork in the old days. How do you tell you have a really good clock? Well, you better have a better one to be able to compare it to. So, so it, it's, it's actually pretty hard to do that. But there are beautiful proofs showing how you can do sampling in certain ways to show that your system was quantum supreme. But these problems that, that are being touted, they're useless. I mean, they're interesting academic problems showing that you can put random, uh, random operations together in the end, sample in a certain way to show that you had to you could not have simulated that using a regular, uh, using a non-quantum computer. And again, I think this is worthwhile. It's a milestone. Um, then when we get beyond it, hopefully soon, we can actually do something useful. So that supremacy is valid, but um, by itself, it's not going to be useful for anybody. No. It's just, and, and and in it's fact, not. I think it'll be more interesting if we don't see quantum supremacy, because then the physicist me turns on and says, well, maybe quantum mechanics is wrong. I think that would be even more interesting. Uh question here to the front, and then we'll go over to the middle. Thank you very much for a wonderful discussion. Paul Joyle from NSI. We've heard a lot about what um, America is and Canada is and is not doing related to this. Can you please help fill in the blanks? You touched on China, but my question about China is what role is the private sector in China playing in this whole quantum uh, business? as well as um, universities, and how do they play in this whole competition and innovation? Are they involved, for example, in f the facilitation of patents, et cetera? So give us a perspective on, on that a little more, please. Universities in China. Yeah. So, so I actually just returned from China a month ago. I'm, I'm on the board of, a, of Tsinghua University's uh, Institute for Quantum Computing. And again, the academic in me, I have some very useful collaborators over there. Um, the, the, big, uh, the, the big operation we hear about uh, in, in Hefei is run by U USTC, University of Science and Technology China. Um, and that's, that's where all this money is being herded. Um, so the universities are definitely involved at a very high level. 
Um, in fact, I just noticed in last week's issue of Nature, USTC had a 10-page ad uh, right up front, and a couple of them were on the on their quantum uh, on their quantum hub there. <laughs> yeah, and so so you met, you also uh, asked about industry. Um, uh, Alibaba, Huawei, Tencent. I mean, there there are several conglomerates. I mean, one special advantage they have over there is that the, these conglomerations and the government are sort of the same thing. <laughs> so they have they have deep pockets and they can do things quickly. Um, and in fact, I know the, the the Alibaba chief here in the U.S. is a former colleague of mine in Michigan. He's in Seattle, um, and and it's 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 staggering what his budget is and what what they really want to do and. So I give them a lot, you know, a lot of credit. I think their their industry over there is they're still in the catch up phase. You know, they're well behind U.S. industry, uh, but they are really motivated and they have the entire government behind them. <laughs> so, Any ideas? well, we've we've read uh, at Alibaba in particular. There's a 15 billion dollar figure, but this includes AI and machine learning and quantum is part of that. I don't know what fraction. And there's Baidu also, who's got, uh, I don't know the exact number, but it's, it's in the billions. And then they have a team, and they already have labs, and they're shown. Uh, the industry, government, and universities, they're, they're, they're yeah. really collaborating there. And, and, and for China, when it comes to uh, quantum communication or quantum cryptography, nobody's going to argue that they're not the leader. They're, they're ahead of everyone. So that was their focus for the last 10 years, a lot out of uh, Hefei. Uh, so they were the first ones to put up a satellite and show long-distance quantum cryptography. They've never been a big player in quantum computing all the way up to about two years ago when they made a big announcement. And they're moving fast, and they have a lot of people who are extremely well-educated, very strong scientists. Uh, they're going to catch up real quick. So that's like Denmark, Sweden, Britain, and Russia for downlink? Austria, for sure. Russia, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, I don't know those. So I know they have a downlink. One in uh, one in China and one in uh, in Austria were dem demonstrated that video. After that, I don't know. Your guess is as good as mine. To be clear, that that um, satellite experiment is, is actually a very heroic engineering job to send single photons that distance. Um, it, but the rate at which it works is almost. I mean, it's really useless. It's, yeah. It's, it's, but it is a. It is a. We're here. You know, it's we a we, we can spend a couple of billion on a spacecraft and and show quantum. You know, signals can be transmitted. Yeah. But. I'll, I'll just give you an example of how the, the different size and speed is. So there was a kind of a, a quantum space race to get the first satellite up. And probably the second contender is Canada. We have a, a, an effort in, in Waterloo, which is, you know, I think up to this day has been funded to the level of, I think, $25 million. There's one faculty member, maybe 10 PhDs, couple postdocs. And, but the, the, the Chinese effort, they had like 100 PhD level people. Their satellite itself was $200 million. So of course they got there first. You know, I mean, I would blame them if they didn't. Uh, but that just shows you the difference in size of when they decide to move into something, they do it quick, right? And they do it well. I'm going to take one more question, and then we're going to have, we're going to have Dean Reuter give us some, some wrap up uh, remarks and observations then too. Right here. I'm a Teddy Parker of the UC Santa Barbara. So the two most important quantum algorithms, arguably Shor's algorithm and Grover's algorithm, were both invented in the mid 90s and published in computer science journals completely openly in great detail. Do you think the next breakthrough quantum algorithm could also just be published openly in a computer science journal? Or now that the hardware is sort of in sight, is the next computer science professor to come up with something of that level? Going to say, well, maybe I shouldn't publish. Maybe I should, you know, think about secrecy or how I could profit off this. So, you know, what, what are the chances that the next breakthrough algorithm is just totally public from the academic sector? That's a good question. I think we're seeing a new class of application space in quantum computing, which is optimization. And these are almost all approximate. And the example I like to give is the traveling salesman problem. Uh, if you don't know what that is, if you, uh, if you, uh, spot a bunch of cities on a map, maybe 200 cities on a map, what's the shortest distance hitting every city exactly once? Well, there's only 200 cities, so it's not a really, really a big data problem. But the number of configurations is so ungodly huge, you could never find the exact answer. Well, it's exactly those types of problems that a quantum computer might find an approximation to. And by the way, you can check it 
you can uh, see that it's a shorter distance than the best non-quantum solution. Um, and so there's families of, of, of model solving algorithms like that. And one actually, to, to get to your question, just a few months ago, I haven't read it carefully, but uh, I, this came from an undergraduate student at Texas, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, the Netflix algorithm, recommendation system. If, if you have a profile of the movies you've watched and really like, what, you know, how, how would you rank some, uh, an extra movie there? And so this is a very important logistics algorithm. And this, I think this undergraduate showed that there is a quantum advantage to that algorithm. Um, and it's in the open. It's, uh, it hasn't been published. It's on the archive, which means it's out there, but it hasn't been peer reviewed yet. But uh, from what I've heard, it's right <laughs> uh, from within uh, the community. And so that's a good example. I, I think your point is still good that there may be others out there that we haven't heard of. Maybe they're buried in Fort Meade somewhere. And, and maybe just to add real quick to this, um, when, when we uh, coming back to the, the idea of bubble uh, that we had before, like a, a lot of the spin-off or the startups that you hear about that get funded, or a lot of them are software-based, meaning that you know let's try to come up with algorithms for a computer that don't quite exist just yet. Um, so a lot of those, and again, I'm, it's just hypothetical. That's my view of the field. I might be wrong. But a lot of those is like using this kind of primitives algorithm we know today, which are public, and then try to make them to an actual, solving an actual problem. So I think lots of that will get some IP around it because that's, that's the only value they get, right? How much of those startup companies are actually looking at breakthrough primitives? I would, I would guess a very few because those are so far and few in between that might not be a good business model to, to follow. So I think on the concrete application of known algorithms, there will be a lot of IP. But the chances that the breakthrough algorithm come out of academic and free, I think it's, it's, it's quite high. Any further thoughts? Well, I'm, as Arthur mentioned, Dean Reuter of the Federalist Society. Uh, I, maybe I watch too much Netflix, I'm not sure, but the algorithm always gives me a 98% match for whatever I'm perusing. I get a 98% match. Uh, I want to thank, it's my job to thank, and I'm happy to thank the panelists uh, for being here today. This is fascinating stuff. Uh, and thank Hudson, Hudson as well, and folks at Hudson, especially Dr. Arthur Herman, uh, for, for co-sponsoring this event and for hosting us. Um, in closing, uh, I don't have a lot of thoughts. I'm not an expert in this area, but I think it's imperative uh, that we resist the urge to think of IP and quantum computing as a field for nerds or computer wizards, uh, despite some of the terms we've heard today here, like uh, uh, entrapment, entanglement rather, uh, entrapment is <laughs> <laughs> uh, entanglement, uh, wave equations, superpositioning, and simplified lasers. If there's anything like a simplified laser, I don't know what that is, but um, this is a field I think that it is, these are fields that are proving to be as, as important as they are interesting. Uh, Arthur and some of our other panelists mentioned uh, that there's a potential existential threat here. Uh, I think both from a national security perspective and from an economics perspective, a commercial perspective. Uh, so it requires our continued attention. Um, we need to think seriously about making sure that the United States uh, becomes or remains a leader in quantum computer, co quantum computing, and not not a follower. Um, and we need to recognize the stakes and keep them in mind. Uh, but we also need, I think, to recognize the success uh, to date of the existing IP regime. And I see a bit of a tension in, in some of the remarks here today that, that hasn't been explicitly discussed. And that's sort of this notion of the bubble, the IP regime, all overlaid by the stakes, which sort of require or seem to require some government intervention, whether it's through funding, um, or superintending the whole thing because the stakes are so high, because it's like a moonshot or the Manhattan Project, uh, and to what extent do we let that affect the existing IP regime? So I think there's a lot more uh, interesting ground to, to, to cover, uh, but I commend and congratulate Dr. Herman and, and Hudson for starting this effort. Uh, I think we've made good progress here today, and I thank you all for coming. <laughs>